Time to get some answers to some big questions, and to do that, we've got a friend with a very big brain. That is Jeff McPherson from Grace Theological College, who joins us today for Theological Thursday to talk about what makes a great sermon, and why do we do sermons the way we do? Yeah, Jeff, how you doing, mate? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I don't know about the brain thing, but there's probably a problem there too. So, no, lovely to be with you. And uh, this again. really interesting question too. We were just saying um, before we started that there's a certain rhythm to a church service that I think most of us are familiar with that, you know, you'll go along there. There might be a song. Uh, you might get some notices. Then maybe you'll do a couple more. And then, of course, you'll have the sermon, the kind of meat and potatoes of the service for, for most people, right? But tell us about where did this even come from? Yeah, I, I think I think in the in the past people used to talk about the hymn sandwich. Um, you know, that idea of like sing a hymn, have the sermon. And and it was kind of like what's really important is that, you know, is the sermon and the hymn is or the songs are just packing around the outside so you can actually get um yeah. Yeah, it, it is a it is a great question, isn't it? Because it's one of these things we possibly don't think about. Yeah, it's interesting that you mention a sandwich because I often think about this as negative feedback. Like, make sure you hamburger it so you like sort of soften it with some bread around the outside. Those songs, <laughs> then you get to the meat, which is like, this is what you're doing wrong, and this is what the Lord has to say about it. Is that sort of what you're saying, or is it something completely different? <laughs> uh Look, yeah, I, I honestly don't know where that has come from. I think it's just been an observation that people have made. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe inadvertently, sometimes pastors might give that impression, like, you know, this this is the sort of the big act and, and everything else is unimportant. Um, but I think there's good grounds for it. So let, let's try and unpack that a little bit. You know, uh, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Um, so it's an interesting thing that it's saying, hearing the word of God, or in fact, um, some translate it as hearing the word of Christ. And it's almost as if when we come into a church and somebody opens up the Bible and they stand up and, you know, they're recognized and sent by the church, by the spirit of God, that there is a real sense in which the Lord Jesus is kind of standing among us. And mm. he's like, he's expounding um, the will of God, the mind of God to us uh, through the scripture. So it's kind of this public unfolding um, announcing of God's truth from the Bible. It's been right through the Bible. Go to the Old Testament. You know, the prophets, here's one of the misconceptions that we have, often have about prophets and pro prophetic uh, writing. Most of what the prophets said was actually directed to the people right in front of them. I, I can't remember this, the figures or statistics, but it's something like 90%. Only quite a small percentage was like predictive. You know, what we're saying is like in the future, this thing's going to happen. Most of it was like, God has told me to tell you guys these things about your lives right now, um, whether it's a word of encouragement or or whatever. So, so the prophets did it. And then, of course, when you come into the New Testament, the apostles continue doing that. And, and Paul tells Timothy, uh, you know, to do that in his ministry as well. So how much of this as well is a little bit of a, a cultural hangover too? Because I'm aware that we live in an age where most of us are literate, which I think we can kind of forget sometimes, that many people could not read of their own accord. It was quite a uh, an exercise to even become literate. And so for many people to even hear the word of any sort, let alone the Bible, they needed somebody to read it out to them and then expound upon it. But does that influence then maybe what our sermons look like today? Should things maybe have changed in terms of the way we're presenting the gospel if we're all able to read the Bible for ourselves for the most part? Yeah, I mean, and you guys have probably experienced this if you've traveled around <clears throat> to different places and different cultures. But, you know, preaching and church services in general just look, they do look different under in a different cultural context. And um, so, yeah, I think, I think uh, being more literate does influence the way we engage with the word you know people turn up well at least they probably used to more turn up with their own bibles now they turn up with their cell phones uh, their bible apps and hopefully they're not on instagram they're actually in their bible app at the yeah, yeah, that's true yeah that's always the worry <laughs> um but you know it's i think yeah definitely the preaching but there is something i think about the preaching where you know there is someone standing up and you know, Paul says in Romans, like I'm, he says to the Roman church, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you in Rome. He has never met them. They're already Christians, but he wants to go and preach to them. And, you know, it's this act of sort of unopening up the word of God 
explaining it and and making the inner person or what we call the heart as the sort of target of it is is something very unique that um, just seems to be right throughout the Bible. Mm. Yeah, and there's something very special about getting together in that way and actually having the word minister to you because I think you can read it and the Holy Spirit will reveal stuff to you. But sometimes having another person communicate it in a slightly different way can also allow the Holy Spirit to reveal new things to you from that same section of Scripture like wisdom and insight that you haven't got before. But it's interesting that you talk about the idea of people, you know, being a little bit more literate and maybe being more inclined to bring their Bibles and study their word and maybe they've got study Bibles. So some sermons are sort of geared at that and others are more sort of like five minute TED talks. What's better? (laughs) I mean, what are we aiming for when it comes to preaching a sermon? I mean, not that I preach sermons, but what what is the aim here? Which is better? Is both good or is, you know, one preferred to the other? Yeah, I, I I would say um, what what is the audience? What what can your listeners? What's going to benefit them? Mm. Uh, you know, I was I was in a, a slum in another part of the world where the message was very simple, just ex- simply explaining through the Bible, and then every person who who listened to it because they were mostly illiterate, they turned to each other and they retold that message to each other in pairs wow like i tell you oh this is what it was about then you tell me and we listen to each other and we get it we get it down pat like we've got this we understand this and that was that i was really impressed by that because i just thought that is really just getting the word into people's lives into their hearts so they can go out and into their lives and it's already there, locked and loaded, ready to go to share with others. What do you think makes a good sermon, and what does the Bible have to say about this? Mm. Yeah, so the joke is always um, great stories, you know. Um, I've I've listened to a three-hour sermon uh, once and uh, from a visiting speaker, and I it was actually, I sat through it because they just told stories all the way through. Um, but I don't think there was a lot of, biblical content because most of the stories you know tended to be about themselves this was a long time ago by the way i'm not calling anyone (laughs) (laughs) um but okay here's my list um and this this is i think um it's 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 biblical okay um holy spirit inspired bible um that's at the core of the message that's the source of the message um and the bible is speaking in its own voice Mm. right you're not trying to read into the bible like hey i've got this hobby horse you know or i'm I'm really angry about whatever it is and i want to find a bible verse to hang it on um and the best way to do that is put it you know make sure you read a big enough chunk of the bible so you can see how it fits in in the context it's in so really important Uh, make sure it's based on the bible um i think the person the, the speaker the preacher themselves is really important you know um you go back and read some of the older writers, they'll talk about the piety or, you know, like the godliness of the of the preacher. If you've got someone up the front who you know is, you know, their life is just way out of whack or they're, they're just a horrible person, it's going to be really hard to listen to them, isn't it? So, you know, um, I, think, I think the person, um, and I think knowing your people, really, you know, um, you, it's a, a communication. Yeah, it's a communication through a person or by person um god's truth but it's being communicated to other people and do you know your people that's why you know it's really hard um put in a word here for local pastors you know local pastors get up and preach week by week and um often people will go in and go i just listened to this amazing celebrity preacher on youtube or whatever like how well does that celebrity preacher know you does he know about your marriage problems or issues with your kids and that kind of thing um well i've heard it going for yeah, I've heard it said before from um, other like pastors of local churches who have like conferences and stuff as well and often hear them joke. So, you know, they get to fly in, they hit you with their best stuff. Like this is the thing, maybe the message they've probably preached like a hundred yep. times, really yep. sharpening it through the years. And then of course they're out and you're there to actually still pastor and walk alongside these people, which as you say, is a much more commendable thing than just coming and dropping a word and then leaving. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, the, everything has its place, you know, great preachers have their place, but um, that's just a shout out there to the, you know, local pastors um, coming in every Sunday and, and yeah. preaching. 
Jeff, it really strikes me that one of the most important things around the sermons that you preach to your congregation as the leader of the flock is actually being out there in the fields each day and knowing where those sheep are at, right? Because how can you be relevant to these people that you're leading if you don't actually know them by name and you don't know who these people are? Yeah, absolutely. And and you can you can it means that you can preach with um, insight uh, and sensitivity. Mm. Now you have it, it requires a lot of wisdom because you don't obviously want to be trying to pick up and deal with somebody's deep, you know, personal or pastoral issues or something of that nature. You know, publicly you don't you don't do that. Um, but you know, you you can you can preach with that sort of sensitivity and understanding of where people are at and what they're dealing with and what they're grappling with. Because ultimately, and I think that's my final point is your message wants to be aimed at the inner person, you know, or well, the Bible talks about the heart, you know, out of the heart proceeds all the issues of life. And 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 out of the heart, Jesus talks about how so many of our, our failures proceed from the heart. And so you want to speak to the, the heart. And by the way, that's not just the emotions. Emotions are part of it. It's the I think it's the whole inner person. Mm. Uh, sometimes we we lecture people, and people call that like brain on a stick kind of idea. You know, ah. brains on sticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we 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 are a whole people. We're we're physical, emotional, spiritual, mental uh, beings, and and we come the whole person comes along and and listens to a, a sermon and hears a sermon. What role do you think in terms of skill of, say, something like oratory comes into this as well? Because, I mean, you kind of alluded to it a little bit with that celebrity preacher idea, the the quality of presentation. And, I mean, personal take here is that it's not everything, but it's not nothing. Uh, that Sometimes it can be like, well, that's just showboating and things like that. It's like that's, you know, we don't want to fall into that kind of category. But I think also, too, there's something to be said for how well a person speaks or otherwise, um, that you can't completely discount either, even if you are a preacher with all the other things I've already mentioned, a really Holy Spirit-inspired message, you know your people, but the way you speak is is something. It's not nothing. Yeah, that's why theological colleges exist. Um, it, it, part of the reason why they exist is to, is, you know, we try and help people to learn methods and techniques and improve. A lot of it is actually through critique, you know, mm. painful things like, you know, your video, you get students, you video them preaching, and then you sit down as a class and you oh. go through it. Oh, yeah. and you, you know? You know what really yeah. strikes me with that? Because in the Bible, you see a lot of examples of people who actually aren't really qualified to lead. Like, for example, Moses comes to mind. He had some kind of speech impediment, yet he was called to lead the people, and he called on the help of his brother. And I think ultimately it comes down to the fact that God's going to use anyone if they're willing and he has grace to cover our weaknesses. But if he has called you to something and that is one of your spiritual gifts to encourage people and to prophesy, then you are called to do it. And you are actually called to refine that gift, to hand it over to God and do the very best you can, but also knowing that his grace and mercy is sufficient for your weakness as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so just the whole thing about skill and, you know, in, in the past, people, um, they used to talk about things like rhetoric and oratory and elocution, you know, mm. making sure you pronounce your words clearly. And in the radio, I'm sure it was exactly the same. Um, that's less of a thing now. Um, our, in, in, in a lot of countries like New Zealand, our approach is more, you know, might say conversational, um, engaging, maybe dialogical um, in the sense that it sounds like a conversation rather than a big speech you know like you'd get maybe 50 years ago but in some contexts that is very much how it is presented and you're right uh, Kat because you know no one is no one is going to have all those perfect gifts lined up and um, I know people who you might say have uh, maybe a speech impediment of some form or you know it's a profound hearing loss or whatever it is and they're still being you know God is using them amazingly in mm. um in, in taking his word and ministering his word. Yeah, well, I mean, you talked about that idea too of those um, more academic messages as well, which I feel like is in some ways it's the intangible thing and it might be the hardest thing to try and get real feedback on is the point where you're not just sharing an idea and a concept and a way you're supposed to live, but there is something of the breath of God in it. And I mean, I'm thinking for myself, it's it's very hard to tangibly explain what it is, but I've sat in some messages that are shorter in nature, but painful to listen to. And everything they've said is is accurate. It lines up with what I know of the Bible, but it's just, it's hard work 
whereas other messages maybe go for like an hour, but it's it's invigorating and there's there's life in it. And maybe that's the that's the, I don't know the secret sauce for want of a better term. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the, again it comes down to the whole heart. So to, here's two quick examples. Peter on the day of Pentecost stood up and preached, and we're told that they were cut to the heart and they were like, "Hey, you know, we want to repent. What can we do to be saved?" Stephen stands up and preaches as well, and they were cut to the heart. The same thing, and they were like, "We want to kill you." Well, they did. They killed him. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it so, comes down to the heart of the recipient, doesn't it? Yes, and and the work of the Spirit of God. So there is that. That's that in, intangible. I mean, I've preached messages and people are going like, "Man, you know, you were." I, why were you saying that about me? And I'm like, oh, I didn't even know. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know like, oh, honestly. You said live on stage. That's not nice. <laughs> That's right. So it's a, it's an awesome thing. It can be a bit scary. Um, but, yeah, it's it's. I think God has ordained it, and let's embrace it. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. Jeff McPherson from Grace Theological College joining us today for a discussion around what makes for a good sermon. Ah, amazing. I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. Yeah, don't forget to like and subscribe and turn your notifications on so you don't miss the next video. We'll see you in the next one.